Some 70 years ago when I was a child in a village in rural Iowa, we Anglos in the northern states of the USA had only very limited knowledge of Latin America. There was very little use of TVs, very few people had TVs, only pe few people had telephones, and there was certainly nothing like live, live television from overseas. We'd heard about the Rio Grande, as we pronounced it, and imagined that there were millions of people south of that river who wore sombreros and sat under palm trees to avoid the sun. I learned somewhat more than that when we studied world geography in the sixth grade, but it was still all very distant and exotic. Fast forward seven decades. In the intervening time, I lived two years in Brazil and visited about a dozen other countries in Central and South America and the Caribbean. At the World Bank, I worked with Latin Americans from many different countries. So now I'm aware of the bewildering diversity of the lands to the south of the United States. But I haven't yet been to Guatemala. Uh, I know a few things about the country. It was the heartland of the May Mayan civilization, which built temples and pyramids and palaces and a network of superhighways when Europe was still in the Dark Ages and North America, north of the Rio Grande, was a wilderness. More recently, Guatemala is often mentioned as a country which carried out a meticulously documented national effort to ensure that its children learn Spanish, the national language, not by eradicating their Mayan heritage, but by having children become literate first in their Mayan language and then gradually bridge to Spanish. And then, of course, that's that famous actor from Guatemala, Oscar Isaac. Anyway, today we have a representative from Guatemala who is going to enlighten us on current issues in her country, on Guatemala's relations with the United States, and whatever else she wants to say. Uh, Celeste Marinelli is a career diplomat who started working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Guatemala in 2012. Her first posting abroad was in the Netherlands, where she was responsible for the bilateral agenda between Guatemala and the Netherlands. She was later posted to Thailand, where she was mainly busy helping establish the Guatemalan embassy there. She's currently minister counselor at the Embassy of Guatemala in Washington, D.C. So without further ado, Senora, we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. And thank you very much for the, for the lovely introduction and, um, and for speaking so highly of Guatemala. I think that, and thank you for highlighting our, our very um, millenarian civilization that, that, that we have had, our, our very long, very long history. And um, so thank you for the invitation as well. I know that it was meant for Ambassador Quinones to be here. He had to be called in for some meetings in Guatemala. And then our DCM is on maternity leave, so you are stuck with me. <laughs> this is how you ended up with me. Um, but oh, wow. thank you for the invitation. And also, of course, thank you to Rotary International because the work that Rotary does in Guatemala is, they do a lot of efforts in Guatemala on healthcare, on um, food security as well, and many, many other um, cooperation, uh, extension of, of cooperations that you have in Guatemala. So thank you very much for that as well. And um, I'm going to talk, talk a little bit. I understand that, that you wanted to learn a little bit about the bilateral relation between Guatemala and the United States. So I'm going to give like a, a brief summary of, of this long history that we have had with the US. And I think, well, of course, first to, to understand a little bit and just to tell you a little bit about Guatemala. We are a country that is approximately the size of Tennessee. 17 million people, and um, we have a GDP of approximately 80 billion. And, um, but I also like to say that we have uh, 360 microclimates, and we have uh, 25 different ethnic groups and languages as well. So you can say the dynamic between the US and Guatemala is very intense, not only because we are neighbors and um, you know we have Mexico but we are in the neighborhood 
but also because of the negative issues that I think most of us know from the news. So um, illicit drug trafficking and weapons trafficking, human smuggling, but also we have the positive issues such as like trade and investment among other issues that we have in the agenda. And um, so if you can see from the from what I have mentioned, we have like a very big difference between Guatemala and the US. So just to put in context, you can see that geographically we are very different. We are the size of Tennessee. Need I say the extents of the territory that the US has. And then, um, you know, 17 million people compared to roughly 330 million people here in the US and GDPs that are 20 trillion compared to 80 billion and a GDP per capita of 62,000 in the US compared to 4,000 to Guatemala. So the differences are abysmal, yet they can be good, bad, or they can be advantageous as well. When we talk in international diplomacy about these asymmetries, you can see them in, in different ways. Sometimes we think of them as situations of power. So who, who is the, the predominant country? Which one has more power? So if you see right now with the news that are going on, you can find that there is like a power struggle between the US and China and with the situation right now with the war in Ukraine. So you can talk about like these differences between countries and countries wanting to reach to a level of like certain equality when, when it comes to power. But if you have in context what I, what I mentioned, the, in context to what I mentioned between the US and Guatemala, you will see that there is a very big difference between Guatemala and the US. So how do we approach the public diplomacy of Guatemala with the US? And it's not so much about being equal because there's a long way to go there, but it is to match the interests that both countries have. And we have common interests, which we will, which I will lead to in this in this conversation that we're having. So historically, for the U.S. and not historically, maybe, but recent history, like for for a very for a long time already. And um, regardless of if the party has been Republican or or Democrat, there are three main objectives in the U.S. Uh, diplomacy or public policy with Guatemala. One is to reduce irregular migration. And even today, there was a big announcement from DHS and DOJ on this issue. And combating drug uh, trafficking and transnational organized crime. And um, strengthening the rule of law, which includes fighting against corruption. So these are like the three main issues in, in public policy for the US for Guatemala. And the interests of Guatemala to the US um, I can mention roughly four in general. To increase exports from Guatemala to the US, increase investments from the US to Guatemala, ensure that US cooperation to Guatemala <clears throat> is adequately invested, and that messaging comes in conductive, um, um, conductive to achieving those objectives. And also, uh, we have a big community of, of Guatemalans living in the US, so ensuring that the rights are being are being protected and respected here in the US. Those would be the, the main issues in the public policy of Guatemala to the US. So as you can see, <clears throat> maybe you can think that they are not the same. So where do we find the common ground? There is actually, they can seem different, but there is a lot of common points between them. And um, when I mention with regards to to the regular migration for example we also don't want for migration to happen irregularly to the us so we wanted to to happen in a regular fashion we wanted to be circular through seasonal worker program for example the one that we are implementing recently so we also don't want irregular migration to happen and for that as well we want to promote investment to guatemala so we need investment from the us we want to increase our, um, our trade. We already, our biggest trading partner already is Central America and the US, but we want to enhance that trade of, of course as well. And of course, we do not want drugs transiting our country because we cannot, we are not a country of origin of, of drug production, but 
drug transits through Guatemala. So we get the transit of illicit drugs going to the US and we also get the illicit um, traffic from weapons going into Guatemala from the US. So all of this um, you know, creates criminality in the country, which of course feeds the narco trafficking and, and also the, all the illicit trade that goes on. So we of course are on board of combating those things with the US as well. And, um, and then with regards to, to the rule of law, um, it's very important for us. We also are not, uh, it's very important for us to have, to have a good system of, of rule of law in Guatemala. And it's something that of course, and, and I think that we have learned this through history, not only in Guatemala, but in many other countries, this has to come from the political will of the country. So it's something that has to be addressed in a domestic way in Guatemala. So in the end, you can see that we, we, we find common ground in the public policy that we have between Guatemala and the US. And this is what I think both countries are working together to achieve. And, um, and then, so then who do we work with in the US? There's like multiple partners. It's not only that we work with the Department of State, but we have to work, for example, with CBP and the Department of Justice when it comes to the trafficking of everything. So human smuggling, for example, we address the issue with DOJ and also with, with CBP. Why? Because we have to dismantle the smuggling um, organizations that exist. And for that, we need the intelligence systems of both countries working together. And our, surprisingly, we actually had someone from, um, from what would be our migration office in Guatemala here in the Southwest border of the US um, interviewing Guatemalans, et cetera, to know a little bit how, how, you know, how they were getting to the US. And, um, and surprisingly, it was interesting how CBP found that a lot of information can be provided by our consulates that are in the Southwest border of the US. Because when they speak, for example, with the Guatemalans that are being detained for cultural purposes, they open up more to our consulates than they would to a US agent. So in that sense, it's very important that we, the, what we work together with, with, with CBP and with DOJ as well. Last year, we had a lot of seizures on, and not only on, on drugs that were trafficking to, to the US, but also with regards to dismantling the bands of the, the structures of the, of the human smuggling organizations. And um, this way is how we basically advance in the priorities to, to promote achieving the, the priorities that we have both countries in hand. And um, so we work with DOJ, we work with DOS, of course, we work with CBP and DHS uh, intensely. And we also have to work with USTR for the access of markets. We also have to work with USDA for the access of markets. And then, you know, the laboratories that exist in Guatemala to eradicate uh, flies that are in the food, you know, and, the, and in the crops that have to be exported to the US. So we have to work with all of these agents with the US in order to create prosperity and opportunities in Guatemala for Guatemalans to stay in Guatemala have a comfortable life in Guatemala, not feel the need to migrate, let alone to migrate irregularly and have to go through this like horrible trajectory that, that, that they go through with the human smuggling and uh, enable legal pathways to come to the US. And uh, that in hand makes us have to work as well with the Department of Labor. And then um, we have recently also, what I was telling you that it is in our best interest to have the Guatemalans that are living here have their rights respected. So working with the Department of Labor, making sure that there are not, um, you know, um, child labor situations in, in companies in the US, which happen, unfortunately, and as well with um, making sure that those migrants that are working here, the rights are being respected, that are paying the wages that, that they're supposed to be paying to them. So um, it is it is a very transversal and dynamic relationship that we have with the US with the different agents. So it's not only with the executive branch that we work, but we also have to work with Congress. Congress is very important here in the US because basically it is the entity that assigns the budget and assigns the budget for USAID, of course, and, and the work that 
the US will do abroad in different branches as, as, branches as well. And such as like the, the uh, combating the, the trafficking of drugs and, and, and the seizures that are needed, you know, to happen in Guatemala. We need to have a lot of investment from the, from the US government on this. And this is why Congress plays a really important role here in, in the US. Actually, there are some congressmen right now in Guatemala um, discussing, you know, learning about the situation in Guatemala and to see mm -hmm. how they can better like readdress the, the issues that, that you have here in the Appropriations Committee particularly. And of course, it is very important for us to work as well with NGOs and with think tanks basically to share our view to share the position of Guatemala towards the, the relationship that we have with the US, where we want to, to reach our, the, the goals that we want to reach with the US. And because of the role that, that think tanks play here in the US are very important. And then um, the incidents that they have here in Washington particularly are very important. So it is, it is important for us to have that relationship um, as well with, with the think tanks. And then, um, so basically, when you see the agenda between Guatemala and the US, you can see that there is big asymmetries, but the common goals, which is basically the common good for the, to find the common good for, for the peoples, is the same in the end. We want prosperity for both our nations. We want prosperity for both our peoples. And in that sense, there are many things that we can do and that, and that we are working together to achieve those goals. So we, all, we both want to reduce irregular immigration, we need investment from the US in, in the US in Guatemala. We need to access to have more access to the US market. And we need to reduce, of course, all the criminality that is going through, through our countries through finding legal means to do to achieve the good objectives for the goods of our people. So that in a nutshell. And then we have a video that we want to share. We are more than 3000 years of history, culture, art, and devotion. We are an amazing green paradise that emerges between breathtaking volcanoes, mountains, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Everything you can imagine is here in one place, full of beautiful landscapes where friendly, hardworking, entrepreneurial people live. We are an example of relentless, multi-skilled and qualified workforce of highly competitive and creative people. We are unbeatable. And you know what? We are the most important strategic, political and economic zone in the region that connects the South, Central, North and the Caribbean of the Americas. We are a global intersection with great potential for investment and trade opportunities. Today, we show the world everything we are and what we are made of. This is our country brand. We are Guatemala, amazing and unstoppable. Time for questions? Sure. So in my earlier days, I had a chance to wear your textile, and I noticed in your readings that the textile plays a major role in your economy. And I was looking at the uh, atlas, too. I see that you're between El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico. Would you say that the duns that are traveling through your country is coming from El Salvador and Honduras to the United States or vice versa? The, the sorry? The, the duns. You the had mentioned that. No, from the U.S., actually, South. So it's going down to these countries yeah. like El Salvador and Honduras? I don't know about El Salvador and Honduras, but I know that, that to Guatemala they are coming from the U.S. And I know this because recently we just had a seizure in one of our ports of, of guns, guns that are being trafficked from the U.S. And, yeah. and does the dollar... Or is Mexico. In the last, is, is, the, is the dollar strong in your uh, town? Does the dollar no, do well? The dollar the is strong, dollar? yes. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to let our club know and our visitors from Guatemala that we have a relationship with the Rotary Club of Guatemala City Norte because our International Service Committee sponsored a small project in Chichi Castanango. Ah, fantastic. Uh, it is a project that supports rural <clears throat> women and villages um, called Red de Mujeres, and it's a uh, sort of a chicken cooperative. Uh, 
Go. Chickens for Chichi. <laughs> oh, fantastic. No, thank you. And actually, if I can mention, I know that, um, well, I mean, Rotary does so much work in Guatemala, but I know, I remember specifically, this is some years ago, because, um, yeah, I was young at that time, and my, um, a friend of my mom, who is in the Rotary Club in Guatemala, they were doing this kitchens in the rural areas of Guatemala sometimes don't have the, the pipes that go that go outside of the houses so they used to be inside so Rotary did a big effort in teaching them even how to build stoves that stoves that would have the the pipes the exhaust pipes go outside of of, of the houses because there were a lot of I mean family members were having a lot of problems with their lungs so and this helped a lot. So this is one of the one of the many that initiatives that Rotary, Rotary has done in Guatemala. My question to you is: You shared with us the great interaction you have with the different agencies in the U.S. government. We also know that there are a lot of people from Guatemala are being taken advantage of because either of lack of English or many other things of their status in the US, you talked about the Department of Labor helping you. But we, you and I know right here in uh, Washington and other places, there are still a lot of Guatemalan families that either are not fairly treated, whether through business practices or even families. Uh, many are reported, but I'm sure many, many or more are not reported for various good reasons. How are you planning to address those? Those cases here in the US, oh, we have a lot actually going on. So when what I was telling you about um, the Department of Labor, I'm going to maybe explain a little bit more about this. Um, we recently, so basically, any migrant that, are, that is here in the US, regardless of their migration situation, they are entitled to basic labor rights. So they need to be paid a wage, they need to be under, you know, the conditions, correct conditions in order to work in a safe environment as well. OSHA, OSHA, OSHA yeah, the wages and hours division uh, department as well. So we are engaging through our consulates, we have 23 consulates throughout the US mm -hmm. and our consulates have a specific office of protection for Guatemalan migrants. And um, what our consulates are doing right now, we recently signed an agreement with DOL regarding this, is that they are having engagement with all of these offices from the Department of Labor and with OSHA as well, to share information to the Guatemalan communities so they can learn about their rights and responsibilities as workers here in the US. So if any situation arises in which they could file a complaint because mostly they don't do it because of fear. Um, they, that they can know that, 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 that they shouldn't have fear, that they shouldn't be afraid to file a complaint if a complaint should be filed, right? And that they can do it through the consulate or they can do it directly through the offices of the wage and hour divisions, principally it's with that, with that office. And then um, providing information in the different languages as well. So usually the material is translated into Spanish, but throughout our consulates, we have um, people working in our consulates that speak the dif different languages from Guatemala. Not all of them are Mayan derived, so there's, there's a, a variety. So we can provide also access in the language that the person speaks because sometimes they don't speak Spanish. So um, we also provide that service as well to the Guatemalans here. And then um, when we see a situation, for example, that comes to our attention with regards to child labor, we also address the issue first at a consulate at a local level, but if it needs to come to a federal level, then we step in as an embassy as well. So that is one example of what we do, specifically with regards to labor rights. But then we have situations of people that have been um, trafficked that we learn about later. So we have to address this issue with Health and Human Services as well. And our consulates also in the Office of Protection stepping in this situation. Or recently, we have also been engaging 
I can talk about migration a lot because this is what I do actually. <laughs> this is my main role in the embassy. And, um, but we are engaging a lot as well with the Office of Refugee and, Resett and Resettlement because they are in charge of the minors that come here, unaccompanied minors. They are in charge of um, placing, reunifying them with whoever is responsible for them here, which not necessarily are the parents. So where we step in is that we, I mean, because of how US law it is, we cannot step in and help the process of reunification, but we can provide the documents of identifying the people of both the parents and the child that is being reunified to make sure that they will be in a rightful household. We have also material that we have provided to ORR, so then they can provide it to the family members and to the children in case they need uh, protection or assistance, they can reach out to our consulates and we can provide them the companionship with whatever it's needed. Sometimes it's legal support, sometimes it's economic support as well. If we have Guatemalan the deceased in the US, we also help them help re the repatriation of the bodies back to Guatemala as well. Mm -hmm. And some people don't have the economic means. So we have a fund specifically for that as well. So this is like a little bit of what we do, but there is a lot of services that we provide to the Guatemalan community. Thank you very much for being here and sharing with us. Uh, what would be the three top things that we need to think about you know, for the relationships between your country and the United States? Many times we see small partners, uh, but they need to have you equal respect and equal access. So what would you suggest would be the top three things that you've learned since you've been here? Thank you for being here. Thank you, no, thank you for thank having you, Andy. us. Well, um, one of the things that, that at least, um, I mean, what the ambassador stresses constantly is that sure. to really encourage investment in Guatemala. There have been many pledges. There's many companies that are already based in Guatemala that have like, you know, um, expressed their commitment, but we definitely need at least, um, you know, new investment coming into the country. And um, then access to market. I think that another issue that, that the ambassador usually stresses a lot is that we have uh, many companies in Guatemala that are not necessarily very, very big and that are certified to export in Guatemala, Central America, etc. But the process for these companies to export to the US not the process, but the, the paperwork that they have to go through and the um, they have to go through like this analysis, etc. sometimes can take a really long time just because of bureaucratic reasons. So a, a lot of like red tape is recommended to be to be addressed. And the same with regards to uh, migration. Migration is something that will definitely happen and um, we know 90% of the of the reason why people migrate is for economic purposes, basically. So migration will continue to happen, and we definitely need to have a system more efficient with regards to hiring for U.S. companies to hire migrants in Guatemala. We have a, we also have developed a system right now in Guatemala. That we have like, a, I think like a, not a backlog, but we have like a list of a couple of thousand Guatemalans that are ready to work. We know that it works. Or I mean, with Canada, we have had an experience for many, many years, 100% of them return, you know, they don't leave the country and stay abroad, they return back to Guatemala. So it's a circular migration. But there is a lot of red tape in the US for companies to hire migrants. And this is something that we have stressed the ambassador has stressed a lot not only to the u.s government officials but to congress here as well in the u.s the red tape we believe that um you know we need to to make it easy for guatemala for guatemala for u.s companies mm -hmm. to hire migrants that way we have a more circular migration and and the issue will, i think we would definitely you know you wouldn't have the pressure that you have in the southern border if you would have better places better means for regular migration and circular migration. Madam Minister, thank you so very much for speaking with us today.
Uh, and in honor of your speaking to us today, we uh, have dedicated ourselves, correct me if it's changed over the years, uh, to planting a tree in your honor somewhere in, the, somewhere in the downtown Washington area. It used to be cherry trees, but now we've expanded. Uh, and I think we're planting trees all over the city, uh, one of which I think we'll actually have GPS coordinates for that will be planted in your honor. Thank you so much. Evidencing that. What so an thank honor. You thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.